Hello, fellow Bereans. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, we are going to do a video about Babylon. And the name of it is Come Out of Her or Come Out from Her. You've heard that verse. So I'm going to share my screen with you right away and take you to my blog and show you what we're talking about. Where is it? Here we go. All right. So this is my blog. Berean Bible Journey, all right, and the name of this post is Come Out of Her, and I made this, I'm going to make this video to do a little bit more explaining about this blog post. There's a lot in it, and I want you to get it because it's going to help you. It's a little bit dark, but it's going to help you, okay? So the first thing we're going to talk about is um, Noah, and this is the story of Noah that you never heard. Okay, um, more to it than just Noah on the boat. Okay, so I need to tell you a story and I need you to stay with me until I finish it so you can get the whole picture. All right, once upon a time, there was a man named Noah and he had a son named Nimrod. You might've heard that name. Well, Nimrod and his family um, made some changes to Noah's religious beliefs after they got off of the boat and that has made all the difference all the difference you don't understand wait so keep keep listening we're going to find out how this happened so i need to tell you a story i need you to keep going until we finish it and i need you to be brave and understand how this affects your life because it does all right once upon a time there was a man named noah this is the same noah that built the ark noah's son ham had a son named cush who married a woman named Demi Raymond. All right. Got all that. His son, Ham, you heard of Ham, Sham, and Jacob, right? So Ham married, had a, his, his son named Cush married a woman named Demi Raymond. Cush and Demi Raymond then had a son named Nimrod. So this is Noah's great, great grandson is Nimrod. Okay. Keep that in your head. He is described in Genesis 10 verses 8 through 12. Nimrod is the man who built the Tower of Babel, or Babel, right? Everybody knows about this. He worshipped, he is worshipped as the god of Babylon. And he is believed also to be one of the giants or the Nephilim. All right. After the death of his father, Ham, Nimrod married his own mother, Semiramis, and became a powerful king. All right, I'm going to see if this will zoom in on this graphic here for just a second so I can show you this. See if it will let me. Oh, here we go. So Babylon's first leader was Nimrod. Now, Cush became the father of Nimrod. He became a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Achad and Kalneh in the land of Shinar. That's Genesis 10. 8 through 10. So the name Nimrod means to rebel. He was Noah's great grandson. After Babel, Nimrod then expanded to Assyria, building Nineveh, Rehoboth Jr., it looks like, I'm sorry, Kala, the modern Nimrod, and Resin, this is in Genesis 10, 8 through 12. The prophet Micah refers to Assyria as the land of Nimrod. That's what it was called. Nimrod, through his idolatry and military might, is a type of the Antichrist who is to come, okay? So, Nimrod, Babylon's first leader. The Jewish historian Josephus further describes Nimrod. Nimrod was considered by some to be one and the same as Marduk, the patron god of Babel. The Tower of Babel was said to be his temple, and he was often referred to as Bel the Akkadian word for Lord, the same as the infamous Baal, all the Baal worship that you've heard of, right? Throughout scripture, this is him. Now, it was Nimrod who excited them to such an affront. This is from jo Josephus and contempt of God. He was the grandson of Ham, the son of Noah, a bold man and of great strength of hand. He persuaded them not to ascribe it to God as if it were through his means 
that they were happy, but to believe that it was their own courage which procured that happiness. He also gradually changed the government into tyranny, seeing no other way of turning men from the fear of God, but to bring them into a constant dependence on his power. Who does this sound like? It sounds like the Antichrist, right? He also said he would be revenged on God. If he should have a mind to drown the world again, for that he would build a tower too high for the waters to reach, and that he would avenge himself on God for destroying their forefathers. So this was Nim this is what Josephus said about Nimrod. That was his whole design was to get back at God for destroying the forefathers, and that he would build a big tall tower, and so that God could not reach them, right? And he wanted the dependence uh, off of God and on him, right? Um, one side note, this must have been a family trait, um, this marrying your mother thing. Um, as the seed of Ham, as he is the one who went into Noah's tent and uncovered his father's nakedness. Remember, if you don't know this, in those days, that was a term that meant that he took his father's wife, right? So that was like the ultimate um insult or man up i took your wife he took his father's wife his i don't know if it was mother stepmother or what it doesn't really tell us the child that was born to her then was canaan and remember canaan was cursed and i always wondered why did he curse canaan like what did he do well he was the son of an inappropriate relationship his lineage was known as the canaanite right so now we have Ham's other son, Nimrod, who married his mother, Semiramis. So here we go again. Okay, after Nimrod died, Semiramis claimed to be pregnant by the rays of the sun, her dead sun god husband, and to be expecting the son of the sun god. I mean, this is total copycat of God's plan, which Satan always tries to do. So the child that she gave birth to was named Tammuz. Tammuz was also worshipped as a god, and when he was 40 years old, he was gored to death by a wild boar. These are some statues that you may have seen of uh, Tammuz. This was the basis for a tradition that, okay, keep in mind he was gored to death by a boar or a pig. So this was the basis for a tradition which was begun in his honor, in Tammuz's honor, to fast for 40 days a day for each year of his life for Tammuz. They fast for Tammuz for 40 days. Those who worshiped the son of the sun god then set aside 40 days of weeping for Tammuz. They celebrated Lent one day for each year of his incarnation in which they would deny a worldly pleasure or his pleasure in the afterworld. See Ezekiel 8. All right, so the Lent time frame is actually from the weeping for Tammuz time frame or pay, uh, tradition. So Michael Rood, I don't know if you know him or not, he's, he's a very good teacher, but it says Michael Rood explains very rudely. After many years, his mother Semiramis died. The gods looked favorably on the mother of God, they, they called her, and sent her back to earth as the spring fertility goddess, always depicted as an exaggeratedly endowed, bare-breasted queen of sexual desire. Semiramis was the queen of heaven. She was born again as the goddess Eastar, Ashtart, as she emerged from a giant egg that landed in the Euphrates River at sunrise on the sun day after the vernal equinox. To proclaim her divine authority, she changed a bird into an egg-laying rabbit. Does that sound familiar? So as this cult developed, the priest of Easter would impregnate young virgins on the altar of the goddess of fertility at sunrise on Easter Sunday. No joke. A year later, the priest of Easter would sacrifice those three month old babies on the altar at the front of the sanctuary and dye Easter eggs in the blood of these sacrifices. Huh. So, 
take that and digest it and do what you will with it. So the 40 days of Lent or weeping for Tammuz starts the Easter fertility season. The festivities culminate on Easter Sunday when the priest of Easter slaughtered the wild boar that killed Tammuz and the entire congregation would eat the ham on Easter Sunday. So the pagans believe that the fasting and weeping for Tammuz must be done ahead of the spring equinox in order to bring the spirit of ba the Babylonian god back up from the underworld in time to impregnate the goddess Ishtar. If she does not receive his spirit by the spring equinox, she cannot give birth to the son of the sun god nine months later at the winter solstice. Okay, every year, the maidens fasted and wept for Tammuz for 40 days to represent his 40 years. And every year on the first Sunday after the full moon, after the spring equinox, a celebration was made to honor Ishtar. So a side note over here, note that Lent is a movable observance connected to and preceding the festival of Easter. Easter is celebrated on a day specified only by the Roman Catholic Church and not the Bible. Sorry, it is fixed based on the sun and the spring or the vernal equinox. Lots of tradition we have to come out of here. So we're gonna sum up these little gods by their many names. Note, I say here, this is by no means an exhaustive list and may vary depending on the source. There is so much information on this. So Nimrod is the same as the god Marduk, Dumuzu, Osiris, He's the sun god. Okay, Nimrod built the Tower of Babel, remember? So Nimrod married Semiramis. Her name is Ishtar, Ashtart, Asherah, Ashtaroth, Eoster, Ashtart to the Venetians, Venus to the Romans. She's Isis to the Egyptians, Aphrodite to the Greeks. She was nicknamed the Queen of Babylon and the Queen of Heaven. She is represented by the crescent moon in pagan symbology, the fertility goddess. So all of those religions recognize her as the goddess. Okay. So then you come down to Tammuz, who is her son, supposedly. Um, that's a Babylonian name. He is known as Baal to the Phoenicians, Adonis to the Greeks, Horus to the Egyptians, Eros to the Greek. One of these doesn't go there. I'll have to fix that. <sighs> so all of these names are from the Babylonian gods, even though they're from all these different countries. So to say that the history and the legends and the religions are all mixed up is a gross understatement. We must recognize that our religious traditions are all married in with these pagan religions, unfortunately. You know, the children of Israel were sent off into captivity into these places, and that just made it worse. They married into that. They weren't supposed to, so it just got all mixed up and muddled up together. We know that Satan is a liar and a deceiver, and all he ever wanted to do was usurp the throne of the one true yod and thus he has created a close copycat version of God's plan whenever and wherever he could. So we have what we call holidays. Well, they were originally holy days, and Satan has taken them, twisted them just a little bit, as he is so apt to do, and making, made holiday holidays out of them based on pagan practices and traditions. So what we now have is this distorted version of God's plan in every pagan religion. When you see these... Um, statues and paintings of the virgin mother and child look carefully because it may be Ishtar and Tammuz. We're told that it's the Virgin Mary and Jesus or Yeshua. But as you see, um, there's often these the symbology on their heads. There's a halo behind them. The sun halo on the head will often give it away. Here's some more mother and child predictions. See the sun. And then this is a statue of Semiramis with baby Tammuz. Okay. 
You will also notice the unholy pagan trinity that have been fabricated in the pagan religions. Again, the copycats. Um, so these are the nations under their gods. So we um, Israelites were serving false gods at one point, we know. They were serving Baal and Tammuz, the son of Baal, and Ashtoreth was the queen of heaven. Um, the Phoenicians would have called the trinity El and Ash Ashtarte, and the son was named Bacchus. Babylonians was Belus, married to Ishtar or Ray, and the son was Tammuz again. Um, the Assyrians, it was Ninus and Beltus, and they had Hercules. Greece, they had Zeus and Aphrodite, and they had Dionysius. Rome was Jupiter and Diana, and they had Attis. Egypt had Ra and Isis, and they had Osiris or Horus. You've heard all these names. They're all the same. India had Vishnu and Isi or Devaki, it says, and they had Krishna. China, Panku and Hango Mastupo, and they had Yi. Mexico, Teotl, oh, I cannot say that, Coat, got a little cute. And Quetzalcoatl, I don't, don't know, you can read that. Um, Scandinavian had Odin and Freyda, and they had Balder. So these are the charts of different nations of people who worshipped Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz under all these different names, right? When you change countries, a lot of times you get a different name because they have different meanings in their language. Regardless of these different names and these different cultures and these different legends, it all comes down to this. The Babylonian system that is condemned throughout the entire Bible and whose end is prophesied in Revelation, right? It's the end of Babylon in Revelation. It is based on Nimrod's rebellion against the creator and the subsequent false religion his life spawned. It's all sun worship. It's all Baal worship. And it is all connected to Babylon. This is the religion, I think, and I, I reserve the right to be wrong. And I know that everything I can do or say will be held against me. But I think this is the religion of the mystery Babylon of Revelation that has never completely gone away. It was smushed out a few times and tamped down and, and different things like that, but it has never completely gone away. And it has been morphed into our traditions as Christians. Scripture tells us that Solomon also followed Ashtaroth. Solomon, the wisest guy in the world. The Babylonian cult that started with Ishtar Ashtarte. This is a ancient old drawing that goes with this scripture. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father. And because of his idolatry, what happened? Israel was split into two nations after Solomon's death, as explained later. In 1 Kings, it says, because they have forsaken me and have worshipped Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Zidonians, Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, and Milcom, the god of the children of Ammon, and have not walked in my ways to do that which is right in mine eyes and to keep my statutes and my judgments, as did David his father. Later, King Josiah, or Josiah, destroyed those places that Solomon had built. Remember, you've heard this story. And the king, and this is a picture of Josiah chopping down the ash to repulse. You know, the um, groves that are talked about, there were literally gardens of these Asherah or Asherah poles. The scripture says, and the king commanded Hilkiah, the high priest and the priests of the second order and the keepers of the door to bring forth out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels that were made for Baal and for the grove and for all the hosts of heaven. And he burned them without Jerusalem in the fields of Kidron and carried the ashes of them unto Bethel. And the high places that were before Jerusalem, which were on the right hand of the Mount of Corruption, which Solomon, the king of Israel, had built for Ashtaroth, the abomination of the Zidonians, and for Kamosh, the abomination of the Moabites, and for Milcom, the abomination of the children of Ammon, did the king defile. And he break in pieces the images, and he cut down the groves, and filled in their places with the bones of men. So he did pretty good there. Josiah did, trying to stamp all of that Baal worship out. Most of us 
have been observing and participating in this religion without even knowing it. The ancient rites and traditions are weaved throughout our culture and right into our churches. Gravely, I do believe that although God overlooked the ignorance of earlier times, he now commands all people everywhere to repent. As it says in Acts 17 and 30, um, we didn't know. I mean, I didn't know, you know, any of this. Um, for what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God said. Therefore, come out from among them and be you separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. As yod heh commanded his first Hebrew people, you shall tear down their altars and dash in pieces their pillars and burn their asherim with fire. You shall chop down the carved images of their gods and destroy their name out of that place. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. We are often told in our modern churches that we need to accept Jesus or Yeshua as our Lord, but that's really not scriptural. The one true God that created us is very plain with his words and he will not accept just any kind of worship. A lot of people, I mean, I've been guilty of saying, well, I'll just worship him how I feel like worshiping. Well, if he doesn't want to be worshiped that way, you know, the poor guys that brought strange fire into the temple and it didn't work. And we read of these traditions and dismissing it, but we dismiss it by saying, and Jim Staley always says, well, that's just not what it means to me. I hear people say that all the time. And I said that. I said that. Guilty. I said, I'm going to keep doing this tradition because that's not what it means to me. God knows my heart. But we forget that it doesn't matter what it means to us. It only matters what it means to God. Right? And he said, do not worship me in that way. And Samuel spake unto the house of Israel, saying, If you do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, and then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you, and prepare your hearts unto the Lord, and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hands of the Philistines. And then the children of Israel did put away Balaam and Ashtaroth and served the Lord only. So there they are. They're back. They came back, right? And they cried unto the Lord and said, We have sinned. Because we have forsaken the Lord and have served Balaam and Asherah, but now deliver us out of the hand of our enemies and we will serve thee. Just like us. We all get in trouble and then we're like, oh Lord, okay, I'll do the right thing from now on. All right, whenever you see the words Baal and Asherah and Asherah in scripture, recognize this. It is the Babylonian religion that Nimrod the rebel started. It has been tweaked and distorted and handed down through generations and thousands of generations, and it has been melded right into the modern church. All right, from Easton's Bible Dictionary, look at this. This is the definition of a grove. Hebrew Asherah, properly a wooden image or a pillar representing Ashtoreth, a sensual Canaanitish goddess, probably usually set up in a grove. In the revised version, the word Asherah is introduced as a proper noun, the name of the wooden symbol of a goddess with the plurals Asherim and Asherah. The LXX have re rendered Asherah in 2 Chronicles 15 and 16 by Astarte. The Vulgate has done this also in Judges 3 and 7. Hebrew Eshel, there's some scriptures. The authorized version renders this word by tree. In all these passages, the revised version renders by tamarisk tree. The Hebrew word elon uniformly rendered in the authorized version by plain probably signifies a grove or a plantation. In the revised version, it is rendered oak. So you have to look up these words in scripture and see what they really mean. Oak, plain, it's telling you here tree. These were, this was all this um, pagan worship. In the earliest times, groves are mentioned in connection with religious worship. The heathen consecrated groves to particular gods, and for this reason, they were forbidden to the Jews, to God's people. All right, so here's some pictures over here. This is the Asherah pole again. So they would set them up all in these groves. They look like totem poles, I'm sorry. Um, but that's what that is. Um, so Lupercalia, so if you look at the beginning of the year, Lupercalia and Valentine's Day and Fat Tuesday, lead right into the weeping of Tammuz for 40 days. Whitewashed as Ash Wednesday, 
This leads up to the sunrise service on Easter morning held on the spring equinox. The fertility, eggs, the rabbit, the Easter ham, the celebration of the Immaculate Conception on the spring equinox, followed up later in the year by the celebration of the birth of the sun god at the winter solstice. These are all remnants of Nimrod's worship. This is sun worship. This is Baal worship. This is the Babylonian religion. Revelation speaks of the horror of Babylon and the beast that was and is not and yet is, right? It's still there. Could this possibly refer to Nimrod's Babylonian religion and the pagan festivities that their calendar revolves around? How closely are we following the beast and its ancient religion, if that's the case? Please join me in beginning the process of disentangling our worship of the one true God, yod heh from the Antichrist, centuries-old religion of Babylon. Read more about this post in this post, Church Passover Hunt, Korean Bible Journeys. Um, the the Quartodeciman, Quartodeciman, I think I spelled it wrong, controversy. There was a great argument in the early church around 300 AD about this Easter observance. It was decided that the resurrection of Christ, which was based on the Jewish feast, would be morphed into the Easter sun worship held at the spring equinox. So you can read more about that in that post that have linked their church Passover hunt. And I'll link this blog post below if you want to go refer to some of this. Um, my note, I would say I have no way done justice to this staggering subject. The history, the legends, the traditions are all intertwined in a tangled weave. The information is overwhelming. I have left out much of the gory details. Yeah. I encourage you to research further and pray without ceasing for eyes to see and ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. All right. Please watch some of these verse mapping tutorials if you've never done this. Um, this will open up your Bible study like you would not believe. It is amazing what it does. Um, the wedding, my full length um, video about the correlations between the wedding in, and scripture is amazing. God showed me that and I just still get chills every time I every time I think of it or, or start studying it again. So I'm going to go back up here to the top real quick and show you my blog and let's go home real quick and I will show you on my blog. I'm trying to organize some of these teachings here so that you can go find them quickly. I've added a space for the tribes of Israel and verse mapping, um, the Sabbath that's there, um, prophecy, Hebrew feast. Pink is um, things I never knew, just things that God has showed me in the last couple of years that I just never knew. I don't know what I was doing, but I'm a, I never knew that. It just changes everything. Um, if you click on this link that says stay connected and social media link, you can go on here and it's all the places that you can find me. Okay. Here's my YouTube link, my Instagram, um, the group on the Bi Berean Bible Journey group on Facebook. There's my channel on Rumble. If you'd rather do Rumble and there's is on BitChute, same thing. Uh, there's my Twitter. I don't get on there much because they're so liberal and kick you off. Um, I have a MeWe group as well. Um, this is the book I wrote called A Sabbath Day's Journey. If you are at all interested in studying the Sabbath, that is basically my notes and my study that I put into a journal that you can, will walk you straight through all the scriptures so you can study that for yourself. Um, Finding the Feast is a little uh, ebook that will teach you all the things about the feast and how those line up. This is that. My Journey to the Holy Spirit is um, an in-depth look at speaking in tongues, if you haven't ever looked at that, um, basically that as the sign of the Holy Spirit. So that is it. I want to thank you so much for being with me. Go out. Okay. All right. <laughs> thank you so much for joining Berean Bible Journeys and have a great day.